stay uh, with session types this time with mechanizing session types using a structural view. That's work by Shuta Sano, Ryan Kavanagh, and Brigitte Pinka. And Shuta Hello. is going to explain Testing. us. Okay, I think it's working. Cool. All right, hello. So I'm going to talk about mechanizing session types. These are actually binary session types, as they're called. So in contrast to the global types that were presented previously, it's more going to take a local view. So first, uh, I think mechanization is quite popular in PL, and it's gaining increased popularity, which I think is a really good thing. Now, maybe what's preventing us from mechanizing everything is that it's time consuming, it's difficult, it's tedious, so on. And so I would say that mechanization is currently an art. There are lots of components that we have to mechanize, and each component has their own design challenges, various strategies that people have developed to try to tackle these individual um, aspects. And in particular, I want to highlight the first point, which is on modeling bindings and context. Most languages have a notion of variable binding. And I would say for the functional setting, um, the trade-offs for all these techniques is fairly well understood. Maybe not perfectly, but there have been a lot of nice um, comparisons and a lot of just general, I guess, sheer quantity of mechanizations that one can look at to sort of compare. But on the other hand, for session type systems, which is message passing concurrency, um, there are a couple challenges. One is that there are lots of different systems and formulations, so it's very hard to compare different mechanizations. And that bindings are quite complex compared to the functional setting. So this, in turn, um, does not make, say, techniques in the functional world easily or trivially applicable to the session type setting. And furthermore, we have to deal with a linear type system, which is hard. So bindings are difficult. Higher order abstract syntax is a popular technique um, to mechanize, bind, to um, attack the challenge of bindings. And it's been employed in, functional, in the functional setting, so does it work for session types? Well, we'd encode channel bindings because variables are, bind, uh, variables are channels in session types. And you would um, encode them as functions in your proof assistant, like cock, agda, whatever. And the benefit is that you get the binding infrastructure of the host language for free. You get alpha renaming for free, you get substitution properties for free, and so on. And for some specialized languages, you can even let the host language manage the context, so you don't even have to deal with the context at all. Well, uh, first we still have a linear type system. Most proof assistants don't natively support linear implications, so you can't just simply use higher order abstract syntax to model bindings. And the solution, I will let you know in the next 12 minutes. Um, but before that, um, I think it's also good to talk about what we mechanize. So we mechanize Phil Wadler's classical processes. It's a system based on the curry howard isomorphism with linear logic. And it's quite simple, modular, and I think most of all, it's well studied, and there are lots of extensions. So it's sort of easier to see how our technique scales to, I guess, more modern research. Okay, and to set our expectations, I'm going to be talking about development of a new calculus called Structural Classical Processes. The main summary is that we're going to outright remove the requirement of linear context in CP. We're also going to be mechanizing that in the Proof Assistant Beluga, which, um, and mostly I'll be talking about the first point, which is the encoding of the syntax in the logical framework LF. So some background, we can take a classical intuition, sorry, classical linear logic sequent. Uh, you can label the assumptions and assign a proof term. That gives you a type judgment for a process. You can read it like this. Process P communicates across the binary channels x1 to xn, and they follow the protocols a1 to an respectively. OK, there are type constructors associated with these session types. I'll give just two. There's a plus b which is a form of internal choice. The process should send an in-left or in-right signal and proceed as type A or B. Um, and then there's also the unit, type 1, which corresponds to termination. So here are some scary type judgments. But it's important to focus on the context part, because I'm arguing that the context management, management by linearity is quite difficult. So we say that process can close if it only has an assumption x of type 1. 
So that requires some sort of context operation to ensure the size of the context or ensure that it's, it doesn't have other things. Here's one of the typing rules for plus. The process will send an in-left signal across the channel X, continuous P, and now the type of X changes to A, so to speak. This is a concept known as continuation channels. And so in the context of context management, uh, how do we sort of handle these mutations of types? It's a bit weird, right? And we have the parallel composition rule, which again, I want to focus on the context. It really is about context splitting or context merging if you view it top down. So how do we sort of deal with this context split in the context of mechanization? So introducing structural classical processes uh, where we just outright remove uh, the linearity in the context, but instead we'll be using additional local predicates to ensure linearity that way. So I'll be relying on the predicate lin xp, which you can informally read as channel x and its continuations are used linearly in the process p. And so going back to the first problem, I will slightly address this and then we'll go back and fully address this. How do we ensure that the context only contains one assumption? Well, the idea is going to be that every time we bind a channel, we're going to check this linearity predicate. Um, it's hard to show right now. It will be more clear later. But for now, you can see the type judgment in SCP, which corresponds to this close, uh, which allows an arbitrary gamma, which seems a bit scary uh, because what if we're dropping live channels? Well, the linearity predicate is designed to prevent that. So we'll see how it all connects in the future. OK. And just to give a little heads up of what the linearity predicates look like, here's a very simple one. Um, X is being used linearly in the process close X. Fairly simple definition. OK, here's problem two, continuation channels. The channel type changes. Well, let's keep the old channel. We'll keep X of type A plus B and bind the fresh W of type A. So we're explicitly binding these continuation channels. And the linearity predicate for this construct is a bit more sophisticated than the closed one. So if you want to show that X is being used linearly in this process, you have to continue checking that W is being used linearly in P, the continuation process, and also that X doesn't appear again. Because if X appears multiple times, multiple times, that's duplication. That's a violation of linearity. And finally, the context splitting problem. How do we do that? It's best to look at the linearity predicate first. So we'll look at it from the perspective of one particular assumption, Z. Well, the idea is that if you have this composition of P and Q, Z will appear in P but not in Q or the other way around. So we'll have another rule that says it's linear with respect to Q, but does not appear in P. OK, so that's the technique we're sort of going by. And going back to the circling back to the initial point about the close, well, we said that uh, how do we ensure that all these um, bounded assumptions have the, satisfy the linear, linearity predicate? And here we look at type rules that bind new assumptions. So that's the cut rule. This is CP. In SCP, it looks like this. There are two differences to note. One is that we're not splitting the context. We just keep the same gamma. And the other is that we have these additional linearity uh, predicates over P and Q with the new binding X. So that really ensures that every bound channel is going to satisfy the linearity predicate. OK, and to make this all formal, we have this adequacy theorem, which essentially states that um, our linearity predicate is really capturing linearity. So graphically, we have CP, SCP. SCP is bigger because it has contraction and weakening, so it types more things. Um, you can go back and forth between a subset of SCP and CP. Um, the epsilon is just the encoding because the process syntax is slightly different. But the key point is that we can actually characterize the subset with this condition that everything in the context satisfies the linearity predicate. So that really confirms to us that the linearity predicate is really capturing linearity. And to briefly talk about the mechanization aspect, um, there are essentially three components of the mechanization. First is that we encode the syntax in logical framework LF. We mechanize the type preservation proof in Beluga. And we also, on paper, prove the adequacy of our encoding in the sense of LF. I mostly want to just highlight the higher order encoding part. So um, I'm going to be depending on some 
uh, types name, proc, and tp. Name stands for channel names, proc for processes, and tp for session types. I, I will spare you all the details of um, how you encode the session types because that they're fairly standard. But here you'll see higher order abstract syntax at play. Well, not here, but the next one. So we'll start with something simple. How do we encode the SCP process close X? Well, it's just a constructor that takes in a name. Very simple. OK, now you have this in left process. OK, so the constructor takes a name. Good, that's the X. And then the second argument is a function name arrow proc. So that's what's really encoding this binding of w.p. Um, we're encoding it as a literal intuitionistic function in LF. OK? And in parallel composition, you can play the same game. P and Q really are being bound to these fresh channels X. So both P and Q we encode as name arrow proc, just functions that take a name and output the process. OK? And this is, I think, maybe the most sophisticated part of this encoding is how we encode the linearity predicates. So on paper, we write linearity predicates in a sort of hand-wavy manner, lin xp, right? So in our encoding, we're going to be encoding this predicate as a predicate over functions. Um, they're functions that take a channel name and then outputs a process that treats that input linearly. Okay, so any function that satisfies this predicate will take a name and use it linearly. That's the idea. OK, so here's a simple rule with the close. So the function that takes in an x and then outputs the process close x uses x linearly. That's the idea. OK, so the more interesting rule in left. OK, um, so first of all, if we look at the on paper formulation, we have two premises. Let's tackle the first premise, lin wp. That's covered by the premise in the, in, the, in the encoding, linear p. And the w sort of disappears because we encode these w.p's continuations as a function. So we don't really need to explicitly specify a w. And then the question is, where did the other premise go? The premise that x does not appear in p. That's actually wonderfully covered by higher order unification. So the idea is that the meta variable capital P on the encoding is bounded outside this lambda x. So there's no way that capital P can depend on x. So that's how we recover these free name conditions for free, so to speak. And I was kind of going to talk about the parallel composition, but it's really the same idea as in left. We get the free name condition for free. We have to do some. Um, manipulating because we have to deal with multiple bindings. But really, the idea is the same as in inleft. Okay. So we have two things. We have the meta theory of this new calculus, SCP, and we have the mechanization of it in Beluga. So to talk about it separately, um, SCP we developed as maybe a promising foundation for a session type system that's more about mechanizing. And the key motivation or step is that we try to separate the idea of linearity from being a property of context that you have to encode to this explicit localized predicate. Um, and I also want to argue that this idea, although synergizes really well with HOAS, higher order abstract syntax, isn't just for this technique. Any any sort of way you deal with bindings, you'd have to deal with some linear context. And I'm proposing that if we use SCP, we don't have to deal with a linear context, we can use a structural context, which there are many more libraries available for, you have to deal with fewer operations, and it's better understood, I think. And our mechanization in particular, um, as I mentioned, uses HOAS to encode these channel bindings. And I think the biggest strength we were able to showcase with this style of encoding is that we get these free name conditions for free. And the type preservation proof actually required uh, nine additional lemmas, which is, I think, remarkably small compared to how it's usually done. In fact, a colleague of mine uh, mechanized CP by explicitly managing contexts. And the last time I heard from him, he had 90 lemmas to deal with just the linear context. So linear contexts are, you know, quite difficult to work with. 
And I think there are two interesting avenues for future work. One is to mechanize SCP in non-HOS settings and other proof assistants. Um, I'd very like to see sort of the trade-offs between this additional linearity predicate and the act of not having to deal with linear context. And also, as I mentioned, there are lots of baseline process calculus session type systems that people develop off of. It's not just CP, there are things like GV or SIL. It would be nice to see how this linearity predicate idea works to these other systems as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is very nice. Um, so you gave some motivation for how this makes things easier, but mm -hmm. were there any particular pain points that you ran into? Because it, I mean, it looks quite yeah. a lot more complicated in some ways. Mm -hmm. So the pain point was figuring out the right um, encoding. Um, so there are many ways to sort of encode this linearity predicate. There are many ways to encode this process. We didn't necessarily have to use HOAS. Um, we didn't necessarily have to use continuation channels. Um, and getting it wrong really makes the type preservation proof really tedious. So it took three retries to get that really solid uh, baseline encoding. And once that happened, all the proofs were remarkably simple. So you think you've hit some sort of sweet spot. I, I guess, yeah, you really need to try it out in other contexts to see if it does actually adapt. Yeah, although I think it's worth mentioning that we sort of summarized our, um, I guess, our trial and error into this theory of SCP. We didn't come up with SCP first. We sort of did the mechanization, sort of backtracked, and got SCP. Okay. Um, yeah. Please. Um, so I agree with you, linear contexts are really difficult, um, but other people suffered before, and mm -hmm. I was wondering whether you considered implementing directly into a logical framework that had linear context or on top of an implementation of linear logic. Yeah, so there are some frameworks that really do provide um, linear context management, as you said, like self, like concurrent LF, and so on. Um, the drawbacks to those are that um, they don't have any solid implementation. So although there's a theory behind it, um, we couldn't really sort of write actual code and compile it, so to speak. Um, and as for dealing with the context explicitly, I think that's the standard approach that's taken for mechanizations. And um, I think there are lots of lemmas that you do have to prove to say context splitting is safe. Um, you can sort of either mutate or delete and add channels in a safe manner and so on. So I do think that um, it is like a very promising um, approach to not deal with these linear contexts as long as we don't have a solid um, proof assistant with native support for linear functions. Okay, last question, very fast. Okay, just uh, so so uh, this idea of uh, ty types for objects that evolve uh, in time or uh, in mm -hmm. your derivations is very new to session types, but you you got away with that by rebinding the channel, right? Mm -hmm. This W that you use. So I, I assume your operation semantics will take care of that. Of, yeah, mm -hmm. whenever you have rebinding. So this reminds me that, um, so if you go into the functional languages with session types, this is exactly what is happening there, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, that you, do, that you mm -hmm. rebind so that you don't have uh, a, a one variable that will have two different types along a derivation. So, because one of the, so this is uh, probably, uh, you, uh, my intuition is that you will have all, all the machinery that needed if you want to, to, to look into session types for, for functional languages, mm -hmm. because you already have this rebinding thing, yeah just a comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I think um, there's no obvious challenges, I guess, to apply this technique to, um, say, functional languages with session types. Okay, let's thank again the speaker. <laughs>